Okay, so pro functors. Uh, there is there is one sp specific thing about pro functors that is sort of interesting. Uh, that you, you might have a pro functor defined on sort of on the diagonal, right? Uh, the diagonal of a pro functor means the values of a pro functor at a a, right? For uh, if you, if you take two uh, two copies of the same object, right? If if you think of um, a picture of a pro functor as sort of you take a Cartesian product of C op and C, right? These are the pairs of objects. If you have a here or a here and b here, right? Uh, you have a pair a b here, right? Um, when when this is the same category, C. Well, this is the opposite, but this, it's the same object. Um, the diagonal here is is these pairs a a. So it turns out that um, for a pro functor, you know, you often can uh, get from some other point off diagonal to a point on diagonal. And there are actually sort of two ways of getting to the diagonal, right? Not always, but uh, what, what would it mean? It would mean that you have some some pair a b here, and uh, and you have morphisms that bring you to a a and b b, right? And in fact, the same morphism can be used to get you, if you have a morphism f from a to b, you can use it in two different ways. You can use it to get you from, um, uh, let's say, from b, from a a, you can go to a b, okay? so. From A A to A B, you can go by lifting uh, I D at A and F, right? So that would give you from P uh, P A A to P I D, so A B. Right? So if you lift this pair of functions, IDA and F, it will get you from PAA to PAB. Right? Just by dime out. Special case. Special case. When, I mean, one of them can be an identity function, an identity morphism. Right? We always have identity morphism. So this is a particular case when, when one of them is identity, you know, you can get from the diagonal to off-diagonal. You can also get from PBB, somewhere else, from PBB, right, to PAB by lifting, again, F and IDB, right? F goes from A, B, but this is contravariant in the first argument, so it goes from B to A, right? A prime A, A, A prime. It re reverses, right? So I can use the same morphism F to get me from diagonal elements, so it's actually di from diagonal elements to off-diagonal elements. So there is some structure there, you know, like that, that tells me, uh, you know, it's like once you have stuff defined for the diagonal, then 
the off-diagonal elements are somehow constrained, okay, are you, or you can get to them from the diagonal elements. And in, in particular, it means that maybe I can simplify natural transformations to define a natural transformation only on the diagonal. Like suppose, can, can, I, can I define a natural transformation that would just give me a, a transformation between diagonal elements, PAA to QAA? Why would I want to do that? So let me explain why I would want to do that. Because I want to define an end, okay? <laughs> so let me now explain what an end is. An end is uh, a generalization of a product. It's a generalization of a product when, when uh, the diagram is defined not by a functor, but a profunct. And this is a profunctor that takes a whole category, right? Maps it into set. Actually, map takes a category and, and product of opposite C of C, right? It takes it into a set. And I want to define a product of all the diagonal elements of this profunctor. That might sound, sound like something crazy, but it seems to be extremely useful. So if I want to do this, I would uh, sort of start with, with the same limiting construction. So I, I would say, well, um, I, I had these cones here. Uh, let me generalize these cones. So. Um, the generalization of these cones would be, okay, so here's, here's my C op C, right? Here's the diagonal. So these are the, the elements A, A, and B, B, and so on. This maps it to, uh, to, to these elements P, A, A, P, B, B, P, C, C, and so on, right? So I'm mapping diagonal elements in C of C using, using this um, uh, profunctor. Now I want to take a product of these things, right? So that would be a set, let's call it C, right? Well, maybe I shouldn't call it C, let's call it D. Then we'll run out of um, names plus all these projections okay so I'm taking this product diagram here and I'm sort of spreading it along the diagonal right so so this is C of C that's that's like this category from which I started right this is my profunctor P but I'm looking only at the diagonal elements here. Now, if you do this in a big category, like you know, in Haskell, you would have the category of all types. It means there's like infinitely many of these, and I'm just multiplying them together, right? Seems like a crazy thing to do, right? Inf it's a, like an infinite product. Um, so, uh, so this picture that, that was used, uh, that was called a cone here, it's called a wedge. I don't know why the name is wedge, but it sort of looks like a, like a suspension bridge, right? It's like this is this is the apex. Okay, let me call it apex. 
Okay. Uh, and these are the projection morphism. Each, each of them goes to a particular diagonal element of the profile. So if I call this a wedge, I can define a... There's one thing missing from this, so, so don't uh, protest yet, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll come to, to, to this later. Okay, so suppose that you have this, this, these wedges, right? Just like we did with, with cones, you can uh, define a category of these wedges, right? So if you have one wedge like this, and, and another one, let's say, a prime, right? With all these um, projections, right? then you can define a morphism between them, which would be a morphism between APCs, right? So a morphism between APCs that would make these triangles commute, right? Just like before. Okay? So the, the terminal object in this category of wedges would be the end. That would be called the end. Except that, in, in, remember in this definition of, uh, um, of a limit, we also talked about having these morphisms at the base, right? <clears throat> so, what would be the corresponding things for a profunctor here? I mean, suppose that you have, well, let, let me call this, just, just uh, to simplify things, let me consider PAA and PBD, right? So what would be a corresponding thing uh, in here? Um, we would have to have a morphism, well, we would have to have a morphism that goes from A to B, right? But in order to go from PAA to PBB, we would also have to have a morphism going from B to A, right? G. Then we could lift this pair of morphisms and we would get a function from PAA to PBB, okay? Uh, but this is sort of a very strong requirement. It, it means that, um, we would be only interested in preserving some conditions that start with a pair of morphisms that go in the opposite direction. Sort of like a pre-isomorphism, right? They don't have to be inverse of each other. If they were inverse, they would be an isomorphism. But suppose that you have a category in which uh, morphisms go only one way. There are no opposite morphisms. That would be sort of like if you have a... Um, the partial order category, right? In partial order, all flow goes in one direction, then that would impose no conditions on, on your end. Which means that whatever, whatever structure there is in your initial category is not reflected in the definition of end for this category. The end for, this, for the category in which you have this partial order would be exactly the same as if this category were a discrete category with no morphisms in between, right? So that's not really reflecting the um, uh, properties of this category. So instead what we do, we do a very clever thing, we say, okay, if there is a morphism from A to B, then the next best thing is, we can say, if we have a morphism from A to B, then there is a way of getting, remember, from diagonal elements to non-diagonal elements. Okay? So I can have, I can go from PAA to PAB by lifting by lifting what? By lifting ID and F, right? 
ID keeps an A in place, but turns A into B. Or I can go by lifting F and IDB. Right? This is ID A, this is ID B. Right? Because F goes from A to B, so covariantly changes B to A, contravariantly, right? And, and uh, ID leaves B unchanged. So I have two ways of getting to an off diagonal element, as I mentioned before, right? So the requirement for a wedge or wedge condition is that this diamond here commutes. Okay? So that's my wedge condition. So this is like pi. This, uh, these um, um, projections are called pi A and pi B. Right? So I would have P I D F after pi A must be equal P F I D after pi B. Right? So that's the condition. That's the wedge condition. <coughs> so now you might think, uh, okay, hmm, so how, could, how would we define this kind of wedge in, uh, in Haskell, right? Because we could, we could sort of think of, okay, if, if there were no, if, if there was no wedge condition, then this would be a product. And, and um, okay, how do we define an infinite product in Haskell? That's another question. Okay, well, we can do this. Uh, but the wedge condition is an equality. We can't really encode it in Haskell. And it turns out that because in Haskell, we, we can't, define arbitrarily polymorphic functions. We can only use parametric polymorphism. And if you look at this pi, this pi is a polymorphic function, right? It's a, it's a different function from A, different function from B, different function for C. So it's a polymorphic function. It depends on the type A, B, C, and so on, right? So it's a polymorphic function, and in Haskell, a a polymorphic function can be defined using a single formula, right? Which restricts it very much, as, as opposed to ad hoc polymorphism, in which you can say, I'm defining a different function for Boolean, but if it's an integer, that's a completely different function, and so on. Now, if you want to define a function by one formula for all types, that's a parametric, parametrically polymorphic function. So if your pi's are parametrically polymorphic, then it turns out that the wedge condition is automatically satisfied. Which means that the whole thing simplifies to an infinite product, okay? So now the question is, how do you encode an infinite product in Haskell? Well, so let's, let's uh, consider for a moment uh, the Curry-Howard isomorphism between types and uh, propositions, right? So a product, like if you define a product of two things, right? If you want to define a product of two things, you have to provide uh, elements of these two things. So if, if these two types uh, have elements, means you have at each element of the type is a proof of this proposition. So a type is a proposition. If it's an empty type, then it's false. If it has elements, it means it's true. And every element becomes a proof that this proposition is true, right? So if you want to define a product type, it means you have to provide a proof of A and a proof of B. Because to construct a, a pair, you need two elements, right? So if you want to define, uh, so, so this is equivalent to 
an end of two propositions, right? You have provided the proof of, of the first and the proof of the second. That's like proving that A and B are true. To prove that A and B, right, A and B is true, you have to prove A and you have to prove B. So creating a pair is equivalent to a logical end. So if you want to have like an inf uh, generalize it to sort of an infinite product, right, you would sort of have like you have to prove something, some proposition that is parameterized by some value, right? And, and you have to provide a proof for every A, you have to provide a proof, and then you can create this AND, infinite AND, of these proofs. So to prove something that's universal, right, you have to provide a proof of every single specif specific proposition, right? And that's called for all. So if you have for all A, some proposition P of A. That's a generalization of a product, right? If A goes to an infinite set of, of parameters, you know, this is an infinite product. And in Haskell, we just say for all, okay? So this is for all. We just say for all, for all A. Now we want to have a product of all PAAs, right? For all A, PAA, okay? And that's our end, okay? It's a polymorphic data type, right? So this is very, very important, you know, this, this understanding that for all is really a, a generalization of product, but a generalization of product to an infinite set, right? I mean, if our category were finite, it would be finite set, but, but in, in Haskell, this is an infinite space uh, of, of all possible types, right? Like a category of types, and then we are going for all A, P, A, A. So if you want to generate an element, so this would be your end, right? So this is uh, end of P. Uh, if you wanted to, to create an end like this for a given profunctor, you would have to provide proofs for every A. How do you do that? Well, the only way of providing uh, uh, an implementation for every possible type is if this is a polymorphic function. Right? A polymorphic function actually can be defined by one formula for all types. Right? And that's the trick. So all ends are actually polymorphic functions in Haskell. That's, that's the only way you can generate them. <clears throat> okay, so this is what an end is. I also said that um, a limit can be defined as a natural transformation between two functors, right? We have this picture. We have this diagonal func... Uh, well, it's called diagonal sometimes, but it's diagonal in the functor category. Uh, it's a const functor and some, some functor. We would like to generalize this to profunctors, right? So if we, if we put a profunctor here, we would need uh, a, a generalization of the constant profunctor. But that's easy. A const profunctor takes any pair of objects and maps it into a single object, C, or set. Right? Uh, what does it do to um, morphisms? Well, any pair of morphisms is mapped into identity function. That's 
right? So this is well defined. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so we would like to be able to define a wedge using this kind of uh, thing. Um, and it turns out that the wedge condition can be obtained by insisting that this transformation from delta C to P is, um, is dinatural. Dinatural transformation. We don't need the full naturality, okay? Because we are operating on this diagonal element. Di here stands for diagonal. So it's a diagonal natural transformation, okay? And the way we um, define, so I have a natural transformation here. And again, the way to do this is by considering how, how is natural transformation defined for diagonal elements. So if we start, so let me draw a bigger diagram that starts from PBA, okay? Um, if I have a natural transformation alpha, then I can go from PBA using alpha BA to QBA, right? So I have a natural transformation between two profactors, P and Q, right? Now, naturality condition means that and I will draw like two naturality conditions for very specific pair of morphisms. So I can, so suppose that I have a function f that goes from A to B, a morphism I mean. Morphism f that goes from A to B. What can I do? I can lift it together with identity, P, F, ID, right, to get from PBA to PAA, right? So lifting FID, in the first argument, I'll transform B to A. F goes from A to B, so B to A, opposite direction. A unchanged, right? There is another way of lifting it using ID F, and that will get me to P, B, B, right? So B is left unchanged by ID, and F transforms A to B, okay? Now from P, A, A, I can go to Q, A, A using what? Alpha, A, A, right? From PBB, I can go to QBB using alpha BB. And here I can close these diagrams using, well, now, now in, I'm in Q, so I can lift, using Q, I can lift ID and F. And here I can lift F and ID, okay? Notice these two are naturality conditions for, uh, for the natural transformation alpha that goes from P to Q, right? These are naturality squares. These are natural transformations, these are um, F maps or die maps, right? Die maps, natural transformations. Die maps, natural transformations. So these do commute from naturality if alpha is a natural transformation. Finally, I can close this thing, this diamond here, to Q. This is PBA, so this is this will be QAB, right? This will be the lifting of Q, I, D, F, and this is the lifting of Q, F, 
ID, right? Now, what is this diagram? This diagram only involves queues, right? So this is just functoriality of Q. Functoriality of Q means that if I apply uh, a composition of morphisms, it's the same as applying a morphism. So the composition of FID, this pair FID with IDF gives me FF. Right? The composition of IDF with FID gives me FF. Okay? So this is FF and this is FF. This is the lifting of QFF and this is the lifting of QFF. So it has to give me the same thing. Right? I'm just lifting them in different order, but the result is the same. Right? So if, if Q is, uh, is a functor, it has to lift uh, composition to composition. Right? Okay. So this is a diagram that is true for any natural transformation. Now I'm going to erase the center of this, okay? And notice what, what, what is left. What is left is alpha AA and alpha VB. Okay? So this is this is a transformation. I can I can just forget about off-diagonal elements. I can say I have a transformation that only transforms diagonal elements. And I can call it alpha A really, because I don't have to repeat the same argument. So alpha is a dinatural transformation that is defined only on the diagonal. And it satisfies this diagram. Okay, so this is dinaturality condition. It's enough for me so every natural transformation is automatically dinatural. That's what I showed you before. But I can erase part of it and I can say, well, I'm, I'm going to define uh, a dinatural transformation that's only defined for these diagonal elements. So it goes from PAA to QAA, from PBB to QBB, right? But it satisfies this diagram. If it satisfies this diagram, it's a dinatural transformation. And it turns out that the end can be defined using this diagram as a dinatural transformation. Actually, the wedges can be defined as dinatural transformations. Okay? And uh, I will maybe leave it as an exercise. <laughs> to see that this is really the like it, I mean you have to shrink the the top because your p right your p is is uh, is the delta so all these three things become same c right and so if you replace this with c you get the diamond that defines the wedge condition right so this is the wedge condition. Okay. So this way, using dinatural transformations, you can define wedges, and if you define wedges, you can define ends. And that's how you define ends. Okay? Let's take a break.